Hello, everyone. I'm going to finish off chapter two in the book and in particular talk about uh, unitary operators. And I'm going to go a little bit beyond the book and talk about um, unitarily equivalent operators um, just because it's a important uh, concept. Um, and I'll do uh, examples to really illustrate just how important it is. Um, actually, I'll use uh, unit, the concept of unitary equivalence and Fourier series to explicitly compute the uh, operator norm of discrete convolution, which is actually quite interesting. Um, and uh, a homework will be to do basically the same thing um, for um, continuous uh, convolution, you know, just the usual uh, convolution uh, on L1. Um, all right, so let's start off with um, isometries. Okay, so definition. So if I have a map U from two Hilbert spaces H1, H2, I say it's an isometry. Well, if the obvious thing is true, um, it's norm preserving. Okay. So this is going to be true for any H uh, in H1. Okay. So uh, I want to prove the following proposition, which is. Um, it, yeah, it, it's useful unto itself, I would say. Um, so the following are equivalent for a bounded operator between uh, two Hilbert spaces. So certainly, um, if I have a U that's an isometry, it's, um, and it's linear, then it's a bounded linear operator. Yeah, that's pretty trivial. Um, but this definition here does not presume that U is linear. So, uh, so in particular, in this proposition, I'm assuming that in fact U is linear. And in fact, this proposition is false if U is not linear. I'll do an example of that um, moment. Okay, so the following is true. A U is isometry, B, <clears throat> U is inner product preserving, for short, uh, let's do, let's call this IP, uh, P, inner product preserving. So what does this mean? This means, uh, again, kind of the obvious uh, thing. So for any F and G in uh, H1, we look at this inner product on H2, this is going to be just F uh, G. As is true for all F and G and H1. Uh, and C, U star U is the identity on uh, H1. Uh, and uh, clearly U star U makes sense. U takes H1 to H2, U star takes H2 to H1. Um, right, so what's the uh, proof? So the proof uh, of A implies B Well, that's really just uh, the polarization identity. I'll go through this very quickly.
Uh, so this is going to be, and I'm not going to write H1, H2s, whatever, anywhere. It's just kind of annoying. Um, right, so we're just going to use a polarization identity. Uh, so this is going to be UF plus UG squared minus U F minus UG norm squared plus I U F I U G squared and last but not least minus I And I'm going to, I'm not writing this out to emphasize where we need um, linearity and why you should not expect this to be true without linearity. Okay, so this is, uh, right, this is from just polarization. Forget which video I talked about this. Um, but I certainly needed it to discuss um, orthonormal bases. Um, so something before that. Okay, well, uh, I'm certainly not going to write this again. Um, but so U is linear. So this is going to be U of F plus G. This is going to be U of F minus G. Uh, this is going to uh, be U of F plus I G. I can pull in the I inside and then just take out the U. And this is just going to be U of F uh, minus I G. Okay, um, but we're assuming U is uh, an isometry, so it preserves the norm. So uh, U goes away and get rid of the inner pro uh, the parentheses. So U goes away here. It goes away everywhere. And what I have here is literally just the polarization identity uh, for F and G. So this is F inner product G um, and well, yeah, H2, H1, okay? So that get, takes care of A implies uh, B. So let's do uh, B implies C, and this is not too hard. So I'm doing things a little bit differently than the book does, um, just because I think the book uh, it was one of the rare times. I'm not sure if the book really does things too well, um, but uh, yeah, anyway. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to show that inner product preserving uh, implies that U star U is the identity. Okay. Um, right, so how do we prove that? Well, let's look at for H, um, Let's do uh, for F and G, let's look at U star U, F, G, for arbitrary F and G. Okay. Well, this is going to be just bring the adjoint over U, F, U, G. Um, well, we're assuming by B that U uh, preserves the inner product. So this is going to be F, G. So what does this mean? This means U star U minus the identity um, that on H1 applied to F and a product G 
equals zero. Uh, this is for all F, G, and H1. So you do you know, the obvious thing that we've done probably many times, I don't know how many times. All you do is set G to be exactly uh, this here. I'll just write it. Just saying it to be U star U minus the identity. Well, then this gives um, U star U minus the identity of F squared equals zero um, for all F. This is for all F here. And that does it. That means U star U is the identity. Okay, so now we have to do C implies A, finish up the proof. Uh, right, so I need to show that U star U is the identity implies that uh, sorry, U is an isometry. And that's very straightforward. Um, just figure out what U F squared is. U F, U F. Bring this U uh, over. It's gonna be U star U F. Well, you get the idea. Uh, this is the identity, U star U, so it's FF. And that takes care of the proof, okay? Okay, so uh, yeah, as I mentioned um, here, of course, you absolutely needed to use um, uh, linearity. Otherwise, particularly A implies B falls apart and you know, the proof is, Proof is wrong. Uh, so let me do an example, uh, probably the simplest possible example of a uh, nonlinear isometry on just the complex numbers. So let's say um, yeah, let's say um, this is just the complex numbers. Uh, and let's say f of z is just. So certainly a map, um, bounded map. Uh, sorry, I should specify for what it is. Let's just say it's complex conjugate of Z. So big F certainly takes C to C. It's bounded, it's an isometry. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, not much to that. Well, it's clearly not linear. And that'll be enough to show that it does not preserve the inner product. F of lambda Z is going to be, well, lambda bar Z bar. So F is not linear. Okay, um, so yeah, so let's do this inner product here. This is going to be obviously just usual inner product on C, just F of Z, F complex conjugate of Z for any Z and W. So that's just gonna be Z bar, um, W bar bar which is Z bar W 
whereas uh, z w is z w bar. So obviously z bar w is not z w bar. So this is not inner product preserving. Okay. So without linearity, um, yeah, A implies B is just miserably false. I mean, there's more interesting examples in geometry, um, but you can think of Euclidean geometry. Um, but okay, so uh, let's get to uh, unitary operators. So we've actually uh, talked a little bit about unitary operators or operators already. So um, if I have a, a bounded operator, so bounded linear operator between uh, two Hilbert spaces, that. So we say this is unitary. Or uh, we called it uh, previously a Hilbert space isomorphism. Uh, so, sorry, it says unitary if U is surjective and inner product preserving. Okay. So, if we just tack on um, surjective to uh, any of these equivalent conditions here, then we say that U is a, uh, a unitary. It, U is unitary. It's a unitary operator. All right. Um, and of course, uh, if U is an isometry, then U is injective. So saying that U is inner product preserving and uh, surjective is the same thing as saying U is invertible uh, and inner product preserving, or in other words, U is bijective and inner product preserving. Um, and this really only, we only care about this when U is linear. So that's why we're just assuming that from the start, U is linear. Um, okay, so uh, let's prove the following theorem. which is kind of an analogy of uh, the proposition here for, um, you know, it's the analogy of this proposition here for unitary operators. Uh, so let me just do this on the next another page. I think this is worthy of a theorem. It's not hard to prove, but it's definitely uh, useful. So if I have a bounded, when your operator u from h1 to h2, then u is unitary. Uh, sorry. Then the following are equivalent. A u is unitary. B um, well, we know U is unitary, uh, means as inner product preserve, preserving, and that means U star U is the identity on H1. But if we add surjectivity, then also this A is, uh, A is um, unitary, uh, A is inner product preserving and surjective is the same thing. It's equivalent to saying, this is true and u, u star is uh, the identity on H2. Okay. Uh, so I should mention for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, these two are equivalent. We'll talk about that in a moment. For infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, they are not. B does not imply A. And again, we'll do an example in a moment after I prove this. Kind of a very interesting example. Uh, you know, like a, a 
a nice little departure from what you've maybe done in, um, uh, you know, um, you know uh, advanced linear algebra course. Um, uh, last but not least, U is an invertible uh, isometry. Okay. Um, so what's the proof? Um, okay, so we already proved that, uh, yeah, we proved that you, uh, sorry, so let's do A implies B. So we already proved that, um, that U star U is the identity if U is unitary. Because uh, U is unitary means U is inner product preserving. And we proved that um, that implies U star U is the identity on H1. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's assume now that a U is surjective. So let's say H is in um, H, uh, Let's say uh, H, sorry, is in H2. And because this is surjective, uh, let's assume that we can write H as UH tilde for some H tilde and H1. So I want to prove is that um, UU star H is H. And that's pretty easy to do. Uh, because, well, I'll just write it like this. H is U H tilde. Okay, so uh, we just uh, look at this here. Uh, rather, right, but U, U star is the identity, so um, this is really U H tilde. which is H and that proves it, okay? So that proves uh, A implies B. All right, so let's do uh, B implies C. So we need to prove that U um, is invertible and it's an isometry. So in some sense, C and, and A are, are kind of um, being a bit redundant given my proposition, but uh, I think it's still worthwhile to just kind of record all this information in one theorem. Okay, so uh, yeah, B implies C. So what's B implies C? Well, um, we already proved that U star U is the identity for assuming that implies U is an isometry, so it's isometric, and thus um, U is. Um, 
uh, injective. So clearly an isometry has to be injective. Okay. Really nothing to that. You can just check very trivially. Uh, and last but not least, well, um, U is fairly trivially surjective. So let's say H is in uh, H um, two. Right, so uh, H is going to be written as U, uh, sorry about that, U, uh, U star H. If we're, you know, we're assuming U star U and U U star are uh, both the identity respectively on H1 and H2. Well, obviously this here, U star takes H2 to H1. So obviously this is in H1. So in other words, um, well, this clearly implies that um, U is surjective. Okay, and that gives us um, B implies C. And let's just do uh, C implies A to finish off the proof. Uh, so, right, so yeah, so U is invertible, so U is surjective. U is an isometry, so U is inner product preserving. So U is surjective because U is invertible and U is inner product preserving because it's uh, an isometry and we're assuming it's linear. So that implies that U by definition is a unitary. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, so let me, before I do um, anything else, let me kind of give you the like prototypical, non-trivial, useful, interesting example of a unitary operator um, that's used just you know, over and over and over again in all, all areas of analysis really. Um, and that's just a Fourier series. So Fourier transform is also an example of a unitary operator, but I'll leave, I mean, we proved that, so it's not much to prove really, um, but I'll, I'll talk more about that in the homework um, as it pertains to this course. And um, so, uh, right, let's say H1 is, um, an L2, H1, sorry, equals L2, zero, one. H2 is little L2 of the integers. And let's say UF goes from H1 to H2. Well, it's just given by uh, the uh, nth Fourier coefficient of f. Okay, so let's prove that this is, uh, certainly it's linear. Let's prove that it's unitary. Okay, so let's prove that's an isometry. Well, by the Plancharel theorem, we proved uh, that the L2 norm of F is given by the L2 norm of uh, the Fourier coefficients, the little L2 norm. OK, 
Okay, so it's linear, it's um, uh, norm preserving. So, um, so certainly U is inner product preserving. Well, okay, so, um, right, so, uh, yeah, what we wanna check here is we wanna check C. We wanna check that U is an invertible isometry. So we proved that it is um, an isometry. All we need to prove is that it's surjective. Again, isometry means trivially injective. So we need to prove that U is a surjective, which is very easy. So given uh, C, some something in little L2. Uh, let's just set F to be the sum here. Well, just yeah, do the obvious thing, associate to uh, sequence in the little L2, uh, the obvious Fourier series, two pi i and x. Well, uh, this forms uh, an orthonormal basis. These, these, peop these, these uh, functions here, e to two pi i and x for various n. So, um, yeah, because that's an orthonormal basis, uh, that means that um, because Cn is an L2, then uh, this is also an L2. And UF uh, is just CN. Okay, so certainly U is um, uh, surjective. Okay? U is certainly surjective. Uh, so it's surjective. So U is an invertible. Isometry, so U is unitary. Okay. Um, right. So let me do um, an example. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, that if we're dealing with a finite dimensional vector space, these two are equivalent. Okay. So let me prove that. And let me show you how they're not equivalent uh, necessarily for an infinite dimensional uh, vector space. Infinite dimensional a Hilbert space, meaning um, it has a countable, countably infinite um, orthonormal basis and finite dimensional meaning, obviously it has a finite orthonormal basis. Hence, okay. Um, all right, so you, you probably know from linear algebra, advanced linear algebra that all, uh, I mean, we, we kind of proved it essentially, um, I guess. Well, all, you know, it's enough to basically look at CN. Um, if I want to do, prove something about all finite dimensional vector spaces, they're all isomorphic. Um, so, right. So let's say um, H1 is H2 is just a CN. Yeah, I mean, I, for homework, I gave you that every infinite dimensional, every separable Hilbert space is isomorphic to um, little l2. Basically, the same proof says any n-dimensional 
in a product space is isomorphic to uh, CN, literally the same proof shows that. Um, and all finite dimensional uh, inner product spaces are complete. That's pretty easy to prove, basically. Same proof as CN is complete. So uh, anyway, so right. So let's say um, I have a linear map U that satisfies U star uh, U is the identity. On CN, okay. Uh, so I'll just write I N for the N, I, the identity on CN. Okay. So yeah, let's assume that U is linear. So you know that any linear operator is given by a matrix. Uh, let's put that to very good use. Um, So that means that one is obviously the determinant of the n by n identity matrix, um, which is really the only, that is the uh, linear, that is the identity on CN, the n by n identity matrix. <clears throat> so uh, treating U as a uh, matrix, we take its determinant, u star u, it's the determinant of the product. And this is going to be, uh, do this here. Well, the determinant of an adjoint uh, is just, well, the same thing as the determinant of u, but with a complex conjugate. So this is going to be the determinant of u modulus squared. And the whole point is that this is not zero. I mean, for the purposes, uh, for, these pur for this purpose of, this, for the purpose of this example, sorry, I don't really care what it is, actually. I just care that it's not zero. And certainly, if it has modulus 1, it can't be zero. OK, so what does that mean? <clears throat> That means U is invertible. We have a matrix U whose determinant is uh, not zero, so it's invertible. Okay, so let's now prove that U star U U star is the identity. Um, right, so U star U is just the identity matrix. So uh, U star U, so basically just take this, uh, this, take this right here, Multiply both sides on the left by U inverse. Okay. Well, U undoes the U inverse. So that means U star is U inverse. Uh, and that's in the set theoretic sense. So, and you know, if, if U inverse is U star in a set theoretic sense, then uh, what does that mean? Well, that means um, that, um, well, well, we already know that we're assuming U star U is the identity. Well, that means U star U is U. U star is uh, the N by N identity matrix, okay? So if we're dealing with a finite dimensional in a product space, same thing, finite dimensional Hilbert space, U star U, U is linear and U star U is the identity. 
uh, implies you use star is the identity. Okay. And one thing I forgot to prove, which is uh, quite useful. Um, maybe I'll put this um, kind of as a side note. Move this over here. Uh, so, um, U is unitary is equivalent to, one of the nice things about this is equivalent to U star uh, is unitary. Uh, so let me actually do that another page because uh, there's not enough room here to do that. Right. Right, so you you unitary is equivalent to u star. Unitary, the proof is pretty easy. U star unitary, if and only if, um, well, let's just apply B. Uh, to u star. So it's u star star u star. And this is in general. Um, this is uh, in general. So here I'm assuming that u Not finite dimensional necessarily. Just U is a bounded op bounded linear operator between two Hilbert spaces. All right, so this is the identity uh, on well U star takes H two to H one, so this is the identity on U star uh, on I, uh, uh, on H two. And uh, well, it's normally you u star, but you you are know, kind of replacing u with u star, so it's u star u star star. So this has to be the um, identity. Uh, usually, it's on H two, but because we're dealing with replacing u with u star. U star um, um, uh, yeah yeah sorry um, <clears throat> yeah we're swapping the Hilbert spaces so this is going to be the identity on H one well this is equivalent to just saying U U star is the identity on H two and U star U is the identity on H1. And that's equivalent to, well, U unitary, okay? Okay, so uh, in other words, in, in the finite dimensional case, we actually have also that U star U equals the identity um, is equivalent to uh, u is unitary is equivalent to u u star is the identity. Okay. All right. So let me show you that this is false. Um, what I just said in uh, the uh, infinite dimensional setting. Okay. That u star u equals the identity does not imply u is unitary. And we've already actually seen the uh, example already. So, and it shouldn't be surprising that um, this example here, it, there's no reason on, on earth this should work, uh, you know, 
uh, in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. There is no general concept of a determinant for an operator on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. You, you can, uh, if, you're, if, you, if you look at an operator with a lot of restrictive, with restrictive conditions on it, you, you sometimes can come up with a concept of a determinant, but it's, it's quite specialized. So we're not gonna go anywhere near that. Um, okay, so let's say H1 is H2 is L2. So the example I'm gonna look at is just the shift operator that we've talked about before. So let's say X is X0, X1, X2, et cetera, et cetera. Y is, Y zero, Y one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right, so remember what the, the shift is or what the book calls the forward shift. It basically sticks in a zero here and shifts everything over one spot. Okay, so remember what the adjoint of the shift is, it's a backward shift it basically lobs off the first term of, of Y and starts and shifts everything over to the right, left, to the left, sorry, I almost said to the right. So it's gonna be Y1, Y2, Y3, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let's see that, um, well, I mean, you can see that S is an isometry pretty trivially. Um, so there's not much to that, just definition of the little L2 norm. Uh, but let's directly check. So we know this is linear. We know um, S is an isometry. So we know what S star S is. It's the identity. Let, let's just uh, check that um, directly. So uh, this is going to be a star of um, uh, right. zero, x zero, x one, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so thinking of this as kind of like my y zero, my y1, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to be equal to, well, we just lob off the first one and shift over to the left. So this is X, uh, right, so this is going to be X and therefore uh, S star, S star S is the identity, but um, S is not, A unitary operator. It's it's just not uh, a unitary operator, um, and it's clearly not a unitary operator. That because it's obviously not surjective. It's pretty miserably not surjective. Um, the, uh, the the range is well everything in little l two that has zero in the first component. So. Um, Right, so S star S being the identity does not imply um, that S is unitary. And it kind of clearly says that even for a very innocent looking operator like this here, there's really, you know, determinants as you use them, there's really probably no way to use determinants uh, in a way that you use it in advanced linear algebra. Otherwise, 
if all the theory of determinants did somehow magically work, that this would say u is um, uh, u is uh, invertible if u star u is the identity, and this clearly says no, that's not true. This is s is obviously not invertible. Uh, all right, um, right. So. Let me end this video off talking a little bit about um, unitary equivalence. Okay, so I'm running out of space. So let me get rid of all this here. And I'll get rid of some stuff uh, on the previous page. I really liked the um, eraser here, but uh, anyway, get rid of this. I think five pages should be enough to finish up. Yeah, and uh, in a moment we'll get back. We'll go back to um, the. Uh, Example, the convolution example we did uh, with sure test. Okay, so um, so let's say A is a bounded operator, and we'll come back to this uh, later in the course, towards the end of the course. When we talk about eigenvalues in the spectrum. So let's say I have two Hilbert spaces, H1, H2, not necessarily the same. And let's say I have A and uh, bounded on H1, B is bounded on H2. So we say A and B are unitarily equivalent. If there exists unitary U from H1 to H2, uh, where UA equals BU. So um, the idea is, in some sense, if this is true, then, um, well, I should mention, this is obviously the same thing as saying that uh, A is uh, multiply everything on the left by U star, U star B U. It's a little weird. And that's equivalent to saying um, I'm in trouble with my pen here. Uh, but anyway, that's the same thing as saying B just multiply on the right by u star is u a u star. Okay. All right, so if this is true, if a and b are unitarily equivalent, we write uh, a, uh, you know, kind of to denote that they're equivalent in some way, we write a tilde b like this. So this is a um, equivalence relation. You can check that. And the way you should think is that two operators are unitarily equivalent is, is kind of like saying they're, they're in some sense the same operator. They're going to have very similar properties. Um, yeah. And um, 
Yeah, so maybe it will, I'll briefly talk about uh, in the homework uh, eigenvalues and you'll prove that unitarily equivalent operators have the same eigenvalues. That's pretty easy to prove, um, but anyway. Uh, okay, so get rid of this here. So one uh, particular, uh, I know this is getting long, so I'll leave this for homework. So what's important uh, is that if A is unitarily equivalent to B, then the two have the same operator norms. I wanna put this to very good use. So A, H1 to H1, B goes from H2 to H2. Okay, so let's do an example. In particular, I want to compute the operator norm using everything we've done of discrete convolution. And I'll remind you of what, what discrete convolution is. Let's say C is the sequence here of uh, complex numbers. So it's in little L2 of the integers. Uh, sorry. So I actually want it to be uh, in L1 intersect L2 for this to be true, for, for, for everything to work out well. Okay, um, right. So um, H2 is going to be little L2 of Z. Let's define B from L2 to L2 to B, uh, as I mentioned, discrete convolution. So for a sequence X in L2, Uh, the ith component is just going to be C i minus J X J. So we proved in the last video uh, that um, B is uh, in, well, it's a bounded operator on H2, clearly linear really to that. And of course, uh, yeah, not that needs clarification really, but um, X is an L2. Yeah. Uh, yeah, using the sure test, we proved that um, B is a bounded operator if C is in little L1. Okay, so uh, yeah, I wanna compute, the question is what is the operator norm of B, okay? Um, to do that, we need uh, to pick a unitarily equivalent operator whose operator norm we know and we've already figured out, okay? Uh, and this is pretty, pretty clever of a choice um, to pick, but Let's say uh, H1 is L2 of zero to one. Okay, so given this C, let's say H of X, uh, since C is an L1. Okay, so let's say H is the associated uh, Fourier series. Hmm. 
right? So let's say h of x is this infinite sum here, cn e to two pi i n x, okay? All right, so there's not a whole hell of a lot of um, operator, uh, bounded linear operators on L2 whose operator norm we know. So maybe it's not gonna be so subtle what my A is gonna be. Let's say it's multiplication by H. Um, so um, A, f of x for any f in L2 is just f of x, h of x. Okay, so uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the natural unitary from um, h1 to h2 is what we just discussed. Um, just Fourier, it's just L2 to its Fourier series, Fourier uh, coefficients rather. So, um, okay, so, uh, right, we proved that this is unitary. So I claim, uh, yeah, I claim in fact that um, A is unitarily equivalent to B. So in other words, convolution, discrete convolution by the sequence here is unitarily equivalent to multiplication on the uh, L2 side or on L2 with respect to uh, the special H here, which is just the Fourier series associated to um, H. And I, of course, this is an L2 because C is assumed to be an L2, little L2, so. So this is an L2. No uh, doubts, so there should be no doubts about that. Okay, so I mean, I'll give this, I'll call this a proposition. Okay, so I need to prove that UA, uh, or maybe I'll write it like this. That's what we're gonna prove. So, uh, sorry, UA is BU. Remember, that's the definition of unitary equivalence. Okay. <clears throat> and this is a really nice proof, I think. It's not too hard, but it's basically just uh, an exercise in the theory of Fourier series, really. All right, so let's make our lives ever so much easier than they otherwise would. Let's pick, so I want to make clear, both of these are bounded linear operators, okay? Um, right, so maybe I should emphasize that, uh, Right. So maybe, yeah, let me make something a little more clear if it's not. This is uh, a bounded operator on L2. Because, well, we know the operator norm. We proved that the operator norm is the L infinity norm of H. We did it for the real line. Same proof works for zero to one. Um, right, so uh, MH is on L2 is going to be um, the L infinity norm. Well, the L infinity norm, because CN is in L1, 
just smashing absolute values. Modulus of e to the two pi i and x is just one. So this is trivially less than or equal to the L1 norm of C. Okay. So this is absolutely a bounded linear operator. Okay. Okay, so we have two bounded linear operators, UA and BU. We only need to check that they're equal on a dense subspace because they are bounded. Uh, so by continuity, that, that's enough. So the dense subspace I want to look at, and maybe to make clear, um, this is going to be, Well, everything's on L2, uh, zero to one. Remember U, uh, H1 is L2. And this is L2 of Z. Okay, so, uh, right. So let's say this dense subset of, really it's subspace, uh, but so dense subspace uh, of, L2 is just going to be the finite span uh, of these exponentials. So in other words, F in the span means F has uh, a Fourier series that is um, a finite sum. It's just a finite linear, no, the set of all finite linear combinations of these exponentials. Okay, and that just makes, yeah, let, let me, I'll explain why that makes life technically that much easier. All right, so let's figure out what UA uh, is. Oh, sorry, let's do BU first. So B U F. So first of all, B um, is going to spit out something in L two. So let's just check the coefficients or the the ith term of whatever this is. Okay. Um, well, this is going to be B um, U F is. The Fourier coefficient. So we're taking we're taking this sequence here. B is mapping it to some other sequence, and now we're looking at the ith component. Well, we know what this is. We take the the, the terms here, whatever I'm plugging into H and C I J X J. Um, the sum here. So this is going to be the sum j equals minus infinity. And it's actually a finite sum because we're assuming f, not that it matters really for this, but when we do, when I compute u a, it's definitely going to matter, but it is a finite sum. Uh, so it's uh, kind of my x j here, uh, or let me do c i j. C i minus j f hat of j. Okay. So I want to check that this is what u a f gives me. So u a f is going to be well. Um, yeah. So. All U does is it basically says, well, apply U to AF. That's just literally, um, oh, sorry. So we're applying U to AF. What does U do? U just spits out the, um, uh, Right, U spits out the Fourier coefficient. So by definition, UAF is just the Fourier coefficient of um, 
So yeah, I actually probably may be a little confusing if I put brackets here. Uh, I'm just saying the nth term of uf is the four, you know, the Fourier nth Fourier coefficient. So uaf is just af hat of n by definition. Okay. Um, well, sorry, not n, but i. So what is this here? Well, it's multiplication by h, so this is going to be um, h f hat of i. And we've done this in the continuous case for the Fourier transform. We really haven't done this for the Fourier series. But the Fourier transform, this was last semester. Um, right, so let me formally compute what this is. Okay, now this is where I'm very happy to use that F as a finite Fourier series. So just expand the definition of H. So it's CN e to the two pi I n X. This whole thing times. So uh, first of all, I want to make something clear here. CN is in little L1. So by the Weierstrass, M test, this is uh, uniformly convergent. So H uniformly converges. This is just a finite sum by definition of F being in the finite linear span of these exponentials. All right, so this is This is a finite sum, so absolutely zero ambiguity as to the convergence of HF, H of X, F of X. The sum I'm writing here is a uniformly convergent uh, infinite sum. So CN, F hat of J, combine these two together. So it's E to the two pi I. Uh, sorry, this does not make sense because I have a N here where it should be a J. So this is two pi I N plus J. X. So yeah, this whole thing here, again, by the virus stress M test, only finitely many of the F hat J's are not zero. Infinite, the rest of them are zero. Only finitely many of them are not zero. So this is uniformly convergent. Um, Okay, so let's figure out what the Fourier coefficient is. And the point here is that there's absolutely no problem interchanging, excuse me, sum and integrals. So uh, H F hat of I, is going to be equal to, um, I'm kind of sick of writing, K, well, I'll just write it like this. So it's C, K, uh, F out of I. Well, multiplying by E to two pi, uh, maybe I is not a good choice to use. So let me use uh, K. K is fine.
Yeah, so multiplying by e to the two pi uh, or e to the minus two pi i kx. So it's going to be um, e to the two pi i, uh, say, n plus j x. Well, obviously, I want to combine this. Um, into an exponential, and that gives me n plus j minus k. Uh, you might be able to see where convolution is coming out of this. Okay, so what is this equal to? Well, <clears throat> um, right, n plus j has to be equal to k. Uh, sorry, this is integral of this dx. Okay. So obviously, this equals zero if n plus j is not equal to k, and it's one if n plus j equals k. So I can write this as uh, a pair or sum of all pairs uh, z times z. CK, uh, one second. Sorry, it's CN. It doesn't make sense. Don't know why I wrote that. CN, F hat of J. Yeah, didn't magically turn into Ks. Sorry about that. Uh, so CN, and I got to be mindful of space here. Uh, so it's a CN. Hat of J. Uh, N plus J has to equal um, K. Right, but otherwise it's just C N F hat J. Okay, well, um, this is obviously equivalent to. Um, just uh, n b equals i minus k, or sorry, uh, k minus j. Okay, so given k, given j, n is forced to be k minus j. So I can write this in a much neater way. Let's write it as um, j is any integer. So this is going to be uh, c k minus j. Well, uh, f hat of j. j is j. n is forced to be k minus j. Or in other words, um, f right. So we get exactly what we wanted. C i minus j f hat of j, which is exactly what I have here. The two are equal. So by continuity, again, we've proven carefully that all, you know, both operators, um, AU, uh, or sorry, UA and BU, they're both bounded operators. So by continuity, because we proved that um, UA is uh, BU on this dense subspace, by continuity, UA is uh, BU on all of L2.
Okay, uh, so one last uh, consequence of this, I ran out of space, so I have to go uh, erase all this and then we'll be done. Just give me a moment here. Right, so as a consequence, at least in, in theory, we can, uh, we, we know, um, so just kind of summarize what the point of all this is. So if C is in L1 intersect L2, let's say BC is this uh, convolution operator Uh, sorry, for X in um, little L2, then we have the operator norm L2 to L2 is given by the operator norm of multiplication by H, Now, I say in theory because in practice, how on earth are we supposed to figure out what the L infinity norm of a Fourier series is? I mean, it's really not a very good way of doing it. But anyway, this is still interesting. Um, and again, H of X is this sum here. And for homework, I'll have you do something like this uh, for the Fourier transform. Uh, where you can compute the uh, L2 norm of convolution, a convolution operator using uh, a four, as a Fourier transform, as, as um, uh, yeah, so I'll be more, I'll be more clear uh, when I you know, put forth the new homework. Um, so this is CJ, uh, I guess I did N before, but whatever. So two pi i n x. Okay. So yeah, as I said, it's very rare that we can really explicitly compute um, an operator norm, particularly for a very concrete uh, operator such as this. So. Um, yeah, we, we kind of had to pull out some heavy guns, do this theory of unitarily equivalent operators and theory of Fourier series. But, all right, so enough of that. Uh, this is way too long. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'll grade homework soon and put out new homework soon. All right, take care. Bye-bye.